As we gather tonight on the eve of a day dedicated to the legacy of Dr. King, and that will bring the second inauguration of our nation's first African-American president, I think we all welcome the perspective of someone who can offer a longer and deeper view of past and progress than the pundits who dominate the airwaves today give us. Ladies and gentlemen, David Levering Lewis. Thank you so much, Michael. It's uh, very gratifying to see so many dear friends we knew well and know well in Washington uh, and others who've come because I gather the competition this evening for events is quite stiff. Uh, we have an athletic uh, uh, mo monster event in uh, uh, football and uh, we have Smokey Robinson uh, at uh, the Kennedy Center. So uh, off and running. Uh, 50 years ago, uh, next August, uh, 250,000 Americans gathered in this city to protest racial discrimination as an American. Martin Luther King Jr., 34, leader of the successful Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott, president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC, and engaged in a bitter campaign to desegregate uh, Police Chief Bull Connors, Birmingham, Alabama, spoke last. His speech was one for the ages, an oration whose eloquent content matched the Gettysburg Address, but unlike uh, Abraham Lincoln's address, carefully prepared well in advance of his trip to a battlefield dedication, Martin Luther King's speech was a masterpiece of 11th hour composition and inspired improvisation. He tells us that he only finished it at 4 a.m. on the morning of the 28th. The famous speech uh, commenced uh, with a symbolic, uh, uh, oops, uh, with a Lincoln-esque flourish. I think I'd better put my glasses on. I've just had <laughs> cataract surgery. <laughs> uh, it began with a Lincoln-esque flourish. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand signed the Emancipation Proclamation. As his fine baritone rolled over the great crowd, the audience response was wonderful, Dr. King recalls. All of a sudden, this thing came to me. I have a dream, the phrase that he had used many times before. At that point, I just turned aside from the manuscript altogether and I didn't come back to it, he says. The powerful cadences, the edifying biblical allusions, the hypnotic iteration of the light motif, I have a dream would spellbind the nation. Now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. I have a dream. Uh, probably no better analysis of the multiple sources of the dream speech exists <clears throat> than that offered by the former editor of the King Papers Project, Stanford historian Claiborne Carson, whose new memoir, Martin's Dream, should become indispensable reading for scholars and those interested in the world Martin Luther King helped make. Carson describes the zeitgeist importance <clears throat> of the March on Washington moment and a young preacher's centrality to it. As television beamed the, in, the image of this extraordinary gathering, he writes, everyone who believed in man's capacity to better himself had a moment of inspiration and confidence in the future of the human race. Certainly, that should be true. But I Have a Dream has been a litany depressingly susceptible of disingenuous exploitation, even and especially on some occasions celebrating the third Monday in January. Far too little notice is often paid to the hard economic truth at the heart of the majestic oration, the historic disempowerment of one-tenth of America's people by her dominant 90%. Too often inaudible above the thunder of ceremonial applause for his ennobling dream is Dr. King's remonstration 
that black Americans were dealt a check after the Civil War that came back marked insufficient funds, that the funds on deposit are still insufficient for populations of color and great swaths of others 50 years after the March on Washington and the dream dreamt that epic, the epic day. The bad check note would continue to be sounded ever more loudly until the aspirational content of King's public pronouncements gave way to, in the last months of his life, to a grieved concern for the appalling asymmetry of wealth and poverty in America. When Ruth and I visited the King Memorial for the first time uh, last year, we found ourselves drawn to speculations about the enormous national balance sheet that will have been accumulated as of the 50th anniversary this year of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. The King Memorial confronts Jefferson's Memorial directly across the tidal basin, a perfect study in contrasts. Jefferson, the personification of democratic ideals traduced by his own slaveholding hypocrisy, King, the embodiment of democratic ideals his own society was loath to honor. From that morning speculations came the thought that the reissue of a book about Dr. King and his times written some 40 years ago might profit the historical curiosity of more recent generations. With a new interpretive preface added, professional peers might see some value in a third edition appearing on the eve of the March's 50th anniversary commemoration. My privilege and good fortune, as I hope it may be yours this evening, is to have been asked to reflect on Dr. King's life and legacy by the directors of NYU Washington, the newest unit in what we at NYU proudly call our global network university. Abundant thanks to Tom McIntyre, Assistant Director of NYU's Washington Office of External Affairs and Special Programs, and to Michael, uh, Associate Director of the John Bradamus Center, uh, without whose congenial administrative capabilities, together with their capable staffs, neither uh, this event nor New York University in Washington would have been realized. The day Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, I had reached a decision that I never imagined would be mine to make. Asked to consider writing this biography just two weeks earlier, I was drafting the acceptance letter to the publisher when news bulletins announced the tragedy in Memphis. King, a critical biography, was finished 16 months after Martin Luther King Jr. died a few minutes past 6 p.m on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. The original title was not intended to connote disapproval of its then controversial subject. Rather, it denoted its newly minted PhD and novice author's commitment to the ideal of objectivity prescribed to professional historians. That the choice of title was less problematic than it well might have been was signaled early on in the canonical American Historical Review where I was relieved to read a distinguished senior historian judged King a critical biography to be an excellent book that would do more to keep Martin Luther King and his dream alive in a different era than would more fulsome, a more fulsome tribute. The biography established itself as the first scholarly appreciation of Dr. King. Four decades after a dutiful preface confession that Serious limitations of instant history have not dissipated with the writing of this biography. King, a biography, unfettered of the word critical in the second edition, retains its special value as a book written in the unique interpretive space between Martin Luther King Jr.'s death as a beleaguered public figure and his future beatification as America's greatest secular saint.
The past had already just begun to become unrecoverable from its future. It was still possible to track Michael or ML, the privileged son of a powerful fixture of Atlanta's racially segregated conservative black upper middle class as he absorbed his family's rich religious tradition, acquired a more cosmopolitan academic culture in Boston, alternately led and followed the black freedom movement as it accelerated beyond the control of his nonviolent passive resistance until he surpassed the civil rights parochialism of peers in order to become, to combine racial emancipation, economic democracy, and world peace into a transcendent, if still inchoate, philosophy of human rights that inspired many, yet puzzled and offended many more. I came from the same Atlanta social background as Dr. King, and in the turbulent summer of 1968, I found ready access to prominent families, peers, teachers, associates, opponents, and public figures, most since deceased, whose first-hand memories were as yet unsacralized by an apotheosized Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., Lanky, voluble, E.D. Nixon, Pullman Porter, guardian of Black Montgomery's long smoldering indignation, bounded into the Holiday Inn dining room minutes after I arrived to tell me about the drama among the city's preachers and teachers in the hours after Rosa Parks' arrest on December 1, 1955. He and local NAACP director K.L. Buford replayed the Byzantine yet serendipitous weekend of politics that put a surprised newcomer at the head of an organized bus boycott that would change history. Dora MacDonald, Martin Luther King's private secretary, hadn't a scintilla of doubt that it was John F. Kennedy's late evening phone call to Coretta Scott King that put Kennedy in the White House by the wisp of a margin after King's father endorsed uh, Kennedy. A claim later made in Harris Wolford's of Kennedy's and King and Taylor Branch's 1988 Parting the Waters, even if others have cited misplaced ballots found in Mayor Richard Daley's Cook County and Senator Lyndon Baines Johnson's Texas. Ella Baker, the multitasking civil rights indispensable, who said she seldom met an NAACP official or preacher she respected, served the cause in spite of its misogyny and even though she deplored, as did SNCC leaders Julian Bond and Charles Sherrod, Martin Luther King's pension for opportunistically dropping into and out of local protest hotspots. Where was Dr. King when the Freedom Riders were bleeding on Alabama tarmacs and Greyhound and Trailways bus stations, Baker wanted to know. One heard that Alabama's Reverend uh, Fred Shuttlesworth was still furious that better desegregation terms hadn't been extracted from the Birmingham power structure, uh, no matter the moral high ground seized by Dr. King's inspired letter uh, from Birmingham jail. The transformative 1965 Voting Rights Act had capped Selma Montgomery, a grand racial regional constitutional catharsis that would find its arresting tableau in historian Taylor Branch's sprawling King trilogy. But Stokely Carmichael insisted to me that nonviolence had been more a hindrance than an advantage to what he saw as the civil rights movement's ultimate objectives. Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. may have been one of the few who had known of the covert 1965 collaboration between President Johnson and Dr. King that anticipated the grand Selma Montgomery drama and consequent passage of the Voting Rights Act of uh, 1965. I pause to welcome my daughter, who is uh, here and will be mortified that I'm identifying her. <laughs> what, historians, what historians now describe as their civil rights pas de deux, recorded by the Oval Office's electronic taping system. Certainly, I had no knowledge of President Johnson's critical telephone call to Dr. King on his 36th birthday, uh, setting so much in motion. In late summer 1968, Lyndon Johnson was a president much reviled because of his unwinnable Asian war, 
And I remember interviewing no one who praised his We Shall Overcome address as one of the truly great presidential addresses of all time, as it indeed is. Peering into the, peaked, the uh, packed chamber, Johnson said, but rarely in any time does an issue lay bare the secret heart of America itself. Rarely are we met with a challenge not to our strength or our abundance or our welfare or security, but rather to the values and the purposes and the meaning of our beloved nation. There is no Negro problem. There is only an American problem. Their cause must be our cause too, because it's not just Negroes, but all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice, and we shall overcome. Thus spoke American exceptionalism at its finest. But almost simultaneously, the wizard in the White House ordered Secretary of Defense McNamara to begin bombing North Vietnam, a decision that would gut his great society programs and alienate generations of young people. Thus, what most people remembered in 1968 was Dr. King's speech from the steps of the former capital of the Confederacy at the conclusion of the Selma Montgomery March. His sermon was a stem winder, beginning with an encapsulation of Reconstruction history and ending with a riff of magnificent call and response. He knew that some of his people were asking, how long will justice be crucified and truth buried, he cried. Not long, answered a female voice above the others. He answered her, how long? Not long, because the arc of the moral universe is long but bends toward justice. How long? Not long, because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. American exceptionalism magnificently reaffirmed. Notwithstanding the polls indicating that many doubted whether demonstrations any longer served a positive purpose after the explosion of the Los Angeles ghetto Watts in August 1965 and the parallel sentiments of many in the NAACP and Urban League that times were ripe for pause and consolidation, King decided to move into the urban centers of the North. Heading north, I met young Chicago militants of inconsolable and inconsolable community organizers who disparaged King's pledge to deliver uh, results, nonviolent results in a northern city as a naively provocative, poorly planned and led fiasco. The mayhem encountered during SCLC's march through Cicero matched the savagery of Birmingham. Mayor Richard Daly was puzzled by an opponent who had no purchase price, but after he assembled religious leaders, real estate brokers, bankers, and union bosses to broker the 1966 Chicago Summit Agreement, the White House and much of the civil rights leadership pressed Dr. King to make the best of the bargain. The Summit Agreement was a hollow bargain that might have been a fatal humiliation. Instead, Chicago, the Chicago defeat, proved to be Dr. King's personal catharsis. In a confession of signature insight and candor, after his Chicago miscalculations, Martin Luther King wrote that he had lived too long with the idea of reforming society, a little change here, a little change there. Nervous SCLC preachers had watched King embark on a radical political and economic program that gradually alienated northern white liberals, the business community, much of organized labor, as well as the senior civil rights leadership. NAACP Secretary Roy Wilkins and National Urban League Director Whitney Young assured me that Martin Luther King had badly gauged what was possible after Selma, especially after he ventured his first reservations about the Vietnam War. Fair to say, the permissible parameters 
of what historians denote as Cold War civil rights had been, in, set, had been set in concrete after the 1948 defeat of Henry Wallace's Progressive Party and the ostracism of W.E.B. Du Bois. In A. Philip Randolph's colorful formulation, being black was bad enough, being red was fatal. Dr. King's civil rights audacity was to twin progressivism and pacifism and insist ever more eloquently that Lyndon Johnson's Asian war fatally undermined American democracy. An outrage Lyndon Johnson had good reason to feel betrayed. The Watts riot uh, coming a day, days after passage of the Voting Rights Act made a midterm Republican upsurge in Congress likely after vocalizing the civil rights hymn before a joint session of Congress and privately apprehensive that the White House would bolt, uh, that the White South rather would bolt the Democrats, LBJ believed it at least conceivable that Martin King might endorse a war against godless communism. But as the furies of the urban cauldron and black power extremists beset him and Johnson's great society imploded, Martin King chose to bear the cross of moral greatness. Stanley Levison, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover's bete noir, and one of SCLC's most trusted advisors, told me that King overruled his advice about the dire financial consequences of speaking out against the Vietnam War. Reading Dr. King's Nobel Peace Prize speech, I believed one could have anticipated a redoubled pacifism twinned with an evolving progressivism. He said in his acceptance speech that what self-centered men have torn down, other centered men can build up. And I still believe that one day mankind will bow down before the altars of God and be crowned triumphant over war and bloodshed and nonviolent redemptive goodwill that will proclaim the rule of the land. So he told Stanley Levison, Stanley, I don't care if we don't get five cents in the mail. King's thoughts at this time define the meaning of character. The cross is something that you bear and ultimately that you die on, he preached. It may mean the death of your bridge to the White House. It may mean the death of a foundation grant. It may cut down your budget a bit. An active participant in the anti-war organization <coughs> Women Strike for Peace, Coretta King could have shared Martin's and her tribulations over the costs of their anti-war courage. Although tempted to do so, her book contract prevented our meeting. W.E.B. Du Bois is alleged to have said that he never expected to live to see a militant black Baptist preacher. Truthfully, a similar bias in 1968 prompted me to construe King's evolving civil rights militancy as having less to do with his Baptist faith than with his grounding in secular philosophy. This is not at all to say that the biography ignored the nurturing influence of the Black Baptist Church or the mobilizing power of evangelical Protestantism or that it failed to dramatize the people and the prophet moving in splendid call and response from Montgomery to Memphis. That said, King, a biography, decidedly privileged its subject's philosophical ideas with what was probably an excess of exegesis. Influenced by Reverend J. Pius Barber, a close King family friend who was positive that Martin King found more value in Marxist methodology than it was politic to reveal, I decided the truth lay more with socialist ideas implicit in Rauschenbusch and the social gospel than with the traditionalism of the Baptist faith. I would revise that judgment today. Although only hinted at in the biography, I believed it in an, 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 an unprovable certainty in 1968 that FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover harbored an insensate hostility to Martin Luther King and the black civil rights struggle that would eventually be corroborated. Uh, it would be. Director Hoover politely declined a written request for an interview then ordered a tap on my telephone. 
at home. Seven years later, Senator Frank Church's Committee on Intelligence Investigations exposed outrageous civil liberties violation by the FBI and the CIA. Political scientist David Garrow wrote his indispensable Bearing the Cross, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference with the benefit of FBI files. I was working before, just after the Freedom of Information Act had been enacted. Between the Church Committee's revelations and those served up in Michael Besloss's edition of Electronic Transcripts and Taylor Branch's final volume, it may be said that the tawdry record of the civil liberties perversions perpetrated by J. Edgar Hoover's FBI matched that of a totalitarian dictatorship's secret police. Revealing, <coughs> reviewing uh, Branch's book for The New Yorker, I could still be astonished that Hoover flooded the federal bureaucracies, upper echelons, and the Kennedy and Johnson White House with salacious readings from bugged hotel rooms, as well as putatively definitive reports of active communists at the center of SCLC decision-making. The FBI director dissuaded universities from bestowing honorary degrees, intimidated foundations from making grants, embargoed the communication to King of assass assassination plots, and barred FBI agents from providing him with covert protection. The sex was real. What was never... Hmm. What has never been shown to be real is in any meaningful, significant impact is... Uh, is any significant impact of the sex upon the integrity of Dr. King's public conduct as the premier civil rights paladin of his time. This third edition of King, a biography, appears shortly before the 50th anniversary commemoration of the March on Washington and the democratic vision Martin Luther King shared with the nation that remarkable August day in 1963. The funds on deposit are still insufficient 50 years after the March on Washington and the dream dreamt that epic day. Martin Luther King's crusade of nonviolent passive resistance faltered badly after successful confrontations with institutional segregation in the South. He himself said so on the television program Issues and Answers the summer before his death. It didn't cost the nation anything to guarantee the right to vote or to guarantee access to public accommodation, but we are dealing with issues now that will cost the nation something. What those costly issues were, he had discussed, he had disclosed off the record to SCLC staff members several months earlier. We are treading in difficult waters, he, he told them, because it really means that we are saying that something is wrong with capitalism, that there must be a better distribution of wealth, and maybe America must move toward a democratic socialism. On his last night on earth, Martin Luther King said that he had just wanted to do God's will God had allowed him to go up the mountaintop, and he had looked over, and he saw the promised land. How might the promised land look to Dr. King on the extraordinarily portentous tomorrow when his fellow Americans inaugurate a man of color as their 44th president for the second time, and on the very Monday officially set aside as Martin Luther King Day? A president of color, elected for the content of his character and ability, who pledged fundamental changes to a dysfunctional status quo, had to have elated Dr. King four years ago. Quite likely, he must have pondered at the time the unique assets and liabilities of a president without deep roots in American slavery, the era of Jim Crow, or urban ghettos, and unassociated with the great crucibles of African-American life. We continue to ponder. To be sure, the legacy of Barack Hussein Obama is writing itself as we speak. Many believe that they have already seen enough to recognize in the president's 
signature an aversion to racial discourse and a political, economic, and international pragmatism that disconcerts many of his progressive supporters. In a smart little book entitled Obama's Challenge, published immediately after the 2008 inauguration, a leading progressive economist, Robert Kuttner, predicted that the president would lose his solid majority in the 2010 midterm congressional elections unless he acted audaciously. The key to greatness was living up to the audacity of hope. If he did so, the author believed, Obama would enter the special ranks of transformational presidents after Lincoln, comprised of FDR, LBJ, and yes, Ronald Reagan. To paint history with broad interpretive brushstrokes, it may be argued that the, American, the America afforded our 44th president after tomorrow has come to pass because of Dr. King. Without his unique nonviolent strategies, that troika of civil rights legislation enacted during two years of turbulent African-American struggle, 1964, and 1965 are inconceivable. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, with its Title VII, emancipated black people for the third time and granted American women equal rights for the first time. Gay Americans followed along gamely. As for the 1965 Voting Rights Act, think of voter suppression in Ohio, Florida, and much elsewhere and President-elect Mitt Romney would take the oath tomorrow. Neither King nor LBJ could have anticipated the full force of the 1965 Immigration Act, but Dr. King embraced the rightness of an enactment of its enactment as self-evident, an act that has all but terminated the 200-year biracial narrative of the United States. Think Tea Party anger and a beige majority. Surely, when President Obama places his right hand on the Bibles of Lincoln and King, he means to symbolize his deep understanding of the complicated possibilities he inherits. I should like to close with these words. Mrs. King chose these words that her husband spoke at Ebenezer Baptist Church the month before his death to be replayed at his funeral. The quality, not the longevity of one's life is what is important. If you are cut down in a movement that is designed to save the soul of a nation, then no other death could be more redemptive. Thank you. I would like to step down, but I think uh, I should, as is customary, uh, expose myself to my errors. <laughs> but by taking questions from you, I would be uh, obliged if uh, there were some. significant. I'm grateful for everyone to gather together today. I have a question just based on a conversation I was having with my colleague Najma, who's standing right here, about um, MLK Days of Service. And um, she was noting that she had done participated in the Day of Service and that she was the only person of color there. And we were having a brief discussion as to how, why that might be and how to motivate not only people of color, but young people in general to join in the spirit of service and commemoration of King's spirit? I, I don't suppose I have an answer to, uh, or solution to, to the, the import of the question. Uh, um, I have the impression that uh, there was a greater variety 
uh, with each of these celebrations uh, and uh, a, a larger volume. But uh, I will I will abide by the observation that, that, that you've made. Uh, um, well, um, uh, this is, of course, very important moments of commemoration and celebration in the absence of young people uh, and, uh, and old people. Uh, Americans are busy. Uh, we have an attention span problem that is famous. Uh, we are athletically inclined. Uh, some of us are uh, buying guns. Uh, to, to last hours, which is possible to make such perfect um, uh, It's too bad that that's uh, true. Uh, and I think uh, you must uh, do all you can uh, in your circle uh, to uh, mitigate the, uh, the absence of people. Um, I think that uh, uh, the second Obama term, though, affords an opportunity, as I was trying to suggest, in which uh, the last term, uh, before he becomes lame, uh, a lame duck, uh, many issues that we have uh, been waiting to see uh, addressed will be, uh, and that, in fact, uh, he will, uh, as the gun control debate uh, seems to uh, uh, indicate, uh, be steadfast in pressing his issues and that perhaps there will be even uh, more of an interaction with uh, Congress. Uh, I think that perhaps uh, that has been one of the uh, uh, con concerns of uh, his, uh, 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 his, his loyalists that the president has tended to say uh, that the issues are clear and uh, people have to act upon them. But on the other hand, uh, if you look at what is happening with the gun control, I mean, it's really said it's up to us to uh, get the NRA uh, out of Congress, and that this drumbeat that uh, seems to be taking place uh, will be ongoing, that that approach uh, will, in fact, produce a fundamental change. And perhaps it is really up to us, after all, those people who aren't at the, uh, the meetings, those young uh, black people, and the absence of white people at such uh, gatherings, it is up to us uh, to make democracy uh, more viable. Uh, I'm getting to preach, and I don't do that. <laughs> yes? Thank you. I would like to segue from uh, that question. One of the challenges for historians as we look in the past is to look towards the future. So, <laughs> well, that's for professional. <laughs> but let me ask you, considering that you have the long view and, and possess this history so well, what do you see for coming, say, even 10 years from now, beyond Obama? What kind of a nation are we building, given the challenges that we have right now? Well, that's a, that's a, 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 a tall order to, to answer that. Uh, but I think uh, a cliche that demography is destiny is helpful here. And that is to say that this last election was one in which the people on the wrong side of history lost. And the momentum is clearly going <coughs> in the direction of multiculturalism and uh, uh, greater, uh, greater uh, community. Uh, at the same time that the 1% uh, gets richer. Uh, so I think uh, 10 years from now, we're going to have a, an America uh, with a, a white minority. Uh, although the birth rate of uh, many of the immigrant populations is already beginning to decline, so whites may survive uh, in terms of percentages. Uh, but in any case, we're going to have a very model, tessellated uh, picture of the, uh, of the, the, uh, the, the populace. Um, and it seems to me that lots of social issues are being resolved debates about marriage, debates about partners, and that sort of thing, those surely are going to be uh, uh, resolved. The big problem is the maldistribution of wealth. And uh, it is, in this country, more serious than it is anywhere else in the developed world. And the problem there is that most of us really believe that we would like to be rich. My wife says that every American is a 
spectacle of pre-richness. <laughs> um, because uh, it has worked so well for uh, us for a long time. But resources are limited, uh, and uh, the obscenity of plutocracy, of course, is finally fatal uh, to a society. Uh, but whether or not we can get our handle on the asymmetry of wealth or not is really uh, the challenge. I see no indication that this administration will do a great job in that regard. you speculate, please? What do you think if Dr. King were alive today, he would lament about our society, <coughs> that he would praise about the progress we've made, and that he would be surprised at? It would certainly be a surprise, yes. Um, and, 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 and so then he would say all the more the opportunity. I would never have imagined that we would be at the point we are, I, I dare say he would say. I'm sure W.E.B. Du Bois, whose skepticism about the possibilities of this republic were quite profound, would also concede that we have made progress. And then he would say, as he did, then it's disgraceful not to optimize the possibilities. So I think that would be uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the mindset of, uh, of, of Dr. King, uh, that uh, uh, things have happened, uh, uh, but uh, the challenge is all the greater to make sure that the uh, opportunity to keep going uh, is uh, 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 undertaken and seized. Well, we have uh, upstairs, um, uh, is there a thing or food? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, everyone will continue the conversation upstairs. Professor Lewis will be signing copies of his book. There'll be some refreshments. And Everyone, once again, join me in thanking. <laughs>